Turn to John chapter 4. So it is interesting that this is a parental celebration day because at the heart of this story is really about the heart of a parent. We'll see this in this story, particularly about this man and, uh, who comes to Jesus requesting a miracle. So as we look at this man's story, I just want you to, I want to start with a question. Have you ever thought about exactly how we grow about in faith? My poor daughter was barely up for an hour trying to sip on her morning coffee this morning, and I accosted her with this question. And I knew it was a loaded question. You know, you're not ever supposed to ask questions when there's only one answer, but I put her on the spot. I had only one answer I was looking for, and I kept pressuring her for more. Because it's something that we often don't think about. All her answers were good, but it wasn't the one I was fishing for, so sorry you failed this morning. Um, but have you ever thought about it? What exactly is it? What's the stuff that causes us to grow in faith? And just like my daughter this morning, she shared lots of really good answers and appropriate answers. But one of the key elements in growing in our faith, if we want to grow, if we want to mature, even if we want to mature as human beings, but especially if we want to grow stronger in maturity of our faith and our, and our pursuit of Jesus, we cannot escape this one reality. The, one of the most important aspects that God uses for our growth is trials, suffering, challenges. So my idea this morning that I want us to ponder as we look at this man's story is that growing in faith requires trials that test our faith. In other words, the trials are not the exception to an otherwise successful faith, which we often tend to assume. Trials are the stuff of faith. This is the thing that forges the reality of our faith and causes us to grow and to mature. Now, as we look at the story, at the heart of this story, it's a story about a parent who is desperate to save their child. That's what the heart of this story is. Now, I know but I don't have time to bring out all the aspects of a particular passage. If we were thinking more of a talk about his story and their story, what we might say is this is a remarkable story because in it we have one of those rare examples of where Jesus, who was sent on a mission to enlighten the eyes of his people, the Jewish people who were his contemporaries, Jesus over and over again mentions that that is the goal of his mission. It's not a Gentile mission. Well, it is, but it isn't. Initially, it's a Jewish mission that has at the end of its fulfillment the revelation that this Jewish mission of the Messiah who brought freedom and reconciliation, this redemption and reconciliation is for the world. And then we'll go on to the third part of our book to read more about that as God raises up Paul to be, a, to be apostle to the Gentiles. But for now, his mission and his focus is on Jerusalem and on the Jews of his day. This is an example, though, where we get a foreshadowing that the, that the victory of Jesus and the new covenant isn't just for the Jewish contemporaries of his day, but it is also for the rest of the Gentile nations because this is a story in which Jesus specifically responds to the request of a Gentile. But this morning, we're not going to go quite that theologically deep. I'm sorry for the two of you that that's interesting for. This morning, what I want us to do is look at this man and think about our story and my story. And in particular, the way this beautiful piece of wisdom speaks to the realities of the limitations of our humanity and the non-limitations of the God that we serve and put our trust in. So simply put, we're going to read through this story as we walk through. So I'm just going to summarize it here. This is a story where a, a, a royal official, likely a Gentile, who had heard about the reputation of Jesus. Jesus, I think, is in Cana where he turned the water into wine. This, this official knows that Jesus is there, and this official is suffering. He's suffering because his child is suffering. And according to the story, it is a serious suffering that will likely result in the death of his child. So here is a desperate man who is going to Jesus with all the wrong pedigree. He is not of the chosen race. He's not even of the chosen religion. This man likely takes time to worship a pantheon of gods. Those are the gods to whom he prays. But these gods can't help him. So this man who's of the wrong faith persuasion, 
and of the wrong ethnicity, and to be honest, of the wrong vocation because those royal officials would have been hated among the Jews, Jewish people. He comes to Jesus and says, my son is sick, will you come with me and make him well? And then Jesus looks at this Gentile and it's as though he's allowing this moment not only to be an encounter, not only as an encounter with the living Christ for this Gentile official, but to all the people around that are listening. And he says, will you people not believe unless you see signs? And so he's challenging the official with the idea that you have to trust me even though you're not going to see the manifestation of your trust. And this Gentile complies. Jesus says, your son is made whole. He doesn't require Jesus to come with him to make sure he touches his son so that he can see the result. He simply leaves in faith, just as we sing, taking Jesus at his word. And as he's traveling back, he's met with a group of people from his household and they present the good news to him that your son is well. And the official asks, what time did he get better? And they tell him the precise moment. I think maybe it translates over to about 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And said so that's when his fever broke. And the Gentile official realizes that is the moment Jesus said, your son is well. The, the healing preceded even this Gentile official being aware of the healing. Up until that point, all he had was faith and trust in the words of Jesus. But here we see the manifestation of the miracle. They say, no, your son is well. He recognizes the son became well, the precise moment Jesus spoke his powerful word. And this is what causes this man to turn his life upside down. He essentially that day becomes an atheist. Because by all accounts, he chooses to only believe in one God, so he had to disbelieve in a pantheon of many other gods. So essentially, his atheism brings him down to this one true God in that moment. And it says he believes. And that, and that because of this encounter with the living Christ, this man believes, and because he believes, his entire household believes. So now we see this whole process coming together, not just faith and growth, but the way in which a witness that is born out of an experience with the living Christ is the most powerful witness that there is. It's way more powerful than learning apologetics and having answers to everyone's questions. If you have an encounter with a living Christ and you simply share the joy of that, that is the most powerful witness that we can offer to others. And so we see that full circle as his joy becomes the substance of the faith of other people. So let's walk down this because this story, that in order to get there, there are certain themes and movements of this story. We walk from desperation to faith to healing and to growth, finally, to fruit. And I pray that as we look at this, it might reframe our own understanding of the possible purposes behind trials and desperation. So first of all, first movement of the story is desperation. We pick it up in verse 46. He went again to Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a royal official whose son was ill at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him. And look at this. He pleaded. This is not a mere casual request of a dull, lethargic, apathetic prayer life. This is not an approach of prayer that carries the attitude, been there, done that, it didn't work. This is the energy of desperation fueling real prayer so that this man is in a place of pleading before Jesus. And it says that he went to him and pleaded with him to come down and heal his son since he was about to die. So at the beginning, the most basic reading of this story, it's simply about a father who's desperate to save his son. But beyond that, what we see is an example of someone who is encountering the all too human reality that this life requires us to consistently have to con having to confront the fruit and the consequences of circumstances that are outside of our control. 
And the journey in general, I'm not saying everyone's this way, I'm not trying to pigeonhole anybody, but the general from your 20s to your 50s is a sometimes revelatory but often painful revelation that you are not in control. And that the people that sold you that idea were taking advantage of the zeal of youth and naivety to make you believe that whatever they were selling, teaching, trying to hand out, trying to convince you of, would be the key to controlling the circumstances of your life. This life cannot be controlled and you will never control the outcomes of your life, much less trying to control the outcomes of the people that you love. And the longer you rebel against this lesson, the more damage you will do in your life and in your relationships and in the lives of others. The best that we can do is ask God for a spirit of revelation of humility to, to just own this fact. This life circumstance can't be controlled. And I hate to disappoint you because a lot of you evangelicals in the room, myself included, were made a promise but if you trust Jesus, you'll have some measure of control over the outcomes of your life. I hate to be the one to tell you, but you didn't read the fine print. That's a trick of the salesman. It's not true. Following Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to be immune to the crushing disappointments that this life brings to every single human being. It doesn't change the fact that following Jesus doesn't change the fact that the moment you awake and take a breath is the moment you begin your journey toward death. That's the infant that we're celebrating new life. Welcome to the world. Now you're in the process of dying. Because that's the end of this journey for all of us. And along the way, there are disappointments and heartbreaks and reasons to be mad that God disappointed you. However, there are also encounters with the living Christ that transfer over to a grace that will profoundly change you and transcend you beyond your need to control your life where you will find a place of joy and trust that is bliss beyond being able to control your circumstance. And so he reminds us of this, that there are experiences that, of circumstances that we just cannot control, but he knows where to go in his desperation. In his desperation, he runs to Jesus. And I'm going to submit to you that one of the greatest gifts of your trials and tribulations is that they motivate you to run to Jesus like nothing else in your life. And we run to Jesus and we encounter once anew this revelation. Uh, there's a delay in the screen, isn't there? I'll try to slow down my hand gestures for those thinkers that are being, you're going crazy right now because of the delay. <clears throat> anyway... Now, see, I can't speak if I do this. Uh, I don't even know what I was saying now. Um, what was I saying? Um, do what? I love how the front row actually is, 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 is giving the feedback. So anyway, uh, so, so these encounters, oh, that's what, when we run to Jesus and, and we experience his grace, all of life is reinforcing this one simple lesson. There is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot overcome. There is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot overcome. And so then we move into the section of the story that has to do with faith. Jesus told him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Sir, the official said to him, come down before my boy dies. And so in this little exchange, it sounds like Jesus is offering him a rebuke. And I don't think that that's what's happening here. I think is what he's saying is, can you believe this without seeing it? I'm not going to come to Capernaum. I'm not coming down, but I will do something else. I'll give you my word. Are you willing to believe without seeing the evidence of your belief? This is the evidence of faith. The challenge that Jesus gives is, are you willing to trust what you cannot see in this moment? 
And I don't know about you, but it causes me to pause in the story and reflect. What about you? Have you been required to trust God in circumstances that appeared hopeless? Now, that's an unfair question because I know if you're human, the answer is yes. But we're so quick to want to go past those experiences and forget about them because they're so painful. Well, welcome to church. I want to encourage you. Go back to your last place of desperation. I want you to hold that in your mind. Where was the last place where you were called to trust God in circumstances that appeared hopeless? Maybe you're at the end of that journey, and like this story, it's a happy ending. Maybe you're at the end of that journey, and unlike that story, it's actually a disappointing ending, which we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Or maybe you're still right now in the middle of it. This is the stuff that builds a profound, mature faith right here. When we encounter those circumstances, they appear hopeless. All we can do is pour out to God and trust Him. And I'll tell you, in those moments, prayer is so much easier. Do you ever struggle with guilt about your prayer life? I don't pray like I should. I get bored. I love what Carl Bart said. The best kind of spirit of prayer is akin to a man falling down the stairs and screaming for help. And I love that imagery of prayer. Like that's the heart that keeps our prayer life zealous and passionate and powerful. Your power in prayer is directly related to your willingness to be have a revelation of your need. And this man had a deep revelation of his need, so his prayer plead with Lord with the Lord was intense. And so Jesus offers this challenge. You have to believe me even though you don't see it. And and so the the official is willing to trust Jesus without seeing the miracle. And so we ask ourselves, are you willing to continue to trust God in the midst of circumstances that mock your naive faith? Because that's what it feels like when you are. This will require us to be willing to choose to hope in the yet unseen faithfulness of God. Now, before you know the rest of the story, because I've already told it to you, I don't want to take away to the power of this story, but you can't talk about a story like this without also talking about the reality that that growth in faith for some of us persists because we don't get the answer we were hoping for. What I want you to see, and then you can check out after this statement if you want to. Growth is in the response, not in the result. The growth of faith is found in the response of trust, not your faith worked if you get what you wanted. And that's really important for American Christians to hear because we like to tell success stories of faith that have to do with it ending with happy circumstances. And look, maybe there are people whose lives are more characterized by that. I'm sorry, you got the short end of the stick when it comes to the pastoral passing out. I mean, I, just this morning we were talking to my wife and she was being optimistic. And I said this about happiness. I said, the struggle is, I, I really feel this paradox that my most happy moments are when I'm in most despair. And what I meant by that is not to be negative, but it is the despair that keeps me most faithful to Jesus 100% of the time. And there are other elements too, but despair keeps driving me there. Growth is in the response, not in the result. We already know that this story has a preferred ending, but this is not always the case. And here is why I will make my pastoral confession. I still pray for healing every time I grasp the hand of someone sick or dying. I ask the Holy Spirit to work a miracle and bring healing. But at the same time, I'm going to be honest with you. God has chosen to heal in his way, not mine, in the vast majority of the cases for which I pray for healing. His answer to, his, to, to your, my prayer has been, this is how I'm going to respond. And that's not what I wanted. I, um, in fact, these experiences require an even deeper level of trust in his goodness and a more intense pressing into Christ with that disappointment. I 
every time I pray for the dying. And I pray for healing. And they say, yes, amen. And we both know that the most likely result of this healing prayer is that they're going to be called home where there's no more pain. And those moments never fail, feel like a failure. Every single time I feel like Moses before the burning bush, I need to take off my shoes because I am standing on holy ground. And in that moment, it is not about the result. It is about the powerful, gracious presence of the living Christ. Now, for this story, though, we have a happier ending. From desperation to faith, there is this healing that takes place. Jesus says in verse 50, Go, Jesus told him, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said to him, and he departed. While he, was, while he was going down, his servants met him saying, this boy was alive. So he chooses to take Jesus at his word. And because he chooses to take Jesus at his word, on the way he finds out the miracle has been manifested. Because Jesus' words are not mere sentiments. They have the power and authority to bring about miracles and transformations. And then finally, verse 53 says, The father realized this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, Your son will live. So he himself believed, along with his whole household. Now this was also the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea. To Galilee. So as I said earlier, after the miracle, the official believes and then he influences his entire household. And once again, to remind you that encounters with Jesus are the most powerful stuff of bearing witness to Jesus. So how do we conclude? How might we respond? Well, this story is a reminder of the power of faith and the power of the compassion of Jesus. One of the things that I've um, stumbled into, I've gone ebbed and flow over several years, but it's kind of come back around, is taking time when I read the scripture to re-articulate a prayer response to the scripture. So for example, in a story like this, we might pray, God empower us to emulate the faith of this official, trusting in Jesus' words and finding hope in his promises, even when we don't see the result we're looking for. My friends, we have to draw near to Jesus in times of desperation. Because you're still not going to be in control. And either you're going to be facing that loss of control alone, or you're going to face that loss of control in the spirit of the living Christ that pours out the mercy and grace to sustain you and empower you to grow through that circumstance. So how might we, we respond? Well, number one, what this story teaches us, what the official models is that we are called to turn our desperation into prayer. Now, I don't know all your personalities. For me, my first response of desperation rarely is prayer. It's usually scheming. It's usually doing more of the thing that I did before that I thought would allow me to control the circumstance that didn't allow me to control the circumstance. But I'm convinced if I do more of that thing that didn't work, it will eventually work. So I run back around to that little idol that is my functional savior that I assume will eventually work and it fails. So maybe it's time to turn to Jesus. No, I'll get a better idol. So instead of doing the things I used to do to help me control my circumstances, I'll read books, I'll talk to people, I'll listen to podcasts, and I'll try to figure out some other scheme that will work to empower me to control the circumstances of my life. And then when that new thing fails me, that's usually about the time I'm ready to consider prayer. And I return to the Lord and say, Lord, I have nothing. And then I uttered the most profound prayer that I've ever learned in my entire life. I can't, but you can. I can't do this. The burden is too great for me. Only you can carry this. But I know that there is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot overcome. So, so I, I, I put that scripture in your notes for you to reflect upon. Paul himself says the stuff of our dialogue with God is the stuff of our anxiety. Don't be anxious for anything, but through prayer, give thanks in everything. And so 
And so, so we turn desperation to prayer. But secondly, we own the fact that grow, a growing faith is a practicing faith. A practicing faith is a trusting faith, which means we have to see before we believe. Let me give you a, a let, let, let's all meditate on a scripture that a lot of us like to read quickly through, but let's take some time to savor it this morning. James 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various, various trials. Do you see this? I mean, so much of pragmatic American preaching is about how a real faith in Jesus will empower you to transcend the trials of your life. This is not true. This is a lie. This is false. And in fact, what, G, what, what, what the biblical Christianity says is actually... You don't need to be free. You need to reframe your trials because your trials are not to be a source of anger and frustration and depression. Let the Holy Spirit reframe your experience of trials so that they are actually a, 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 a moment that causes you to be tempted to joy. That's what James says. Consider it joy, my brothers and sisters. So you all came in this morning feeling like you needed to gather in the house of the Lord because you were sad and burdened. When in reality, the truth is that burden has the potential to be your place of deepest joy. And this is what James celebrates. Consider it uh, joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you be made mature, so that you may be made mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, especially those of you who are frustrated and embittered about your trials of your life, have you ever, in a moment of foolish inspiration, maybe at a time of worship, said, Lord, do whatever you must do to draw me closer to you? Lord, just grow me up, just use me, Lord. Just equip me to be used. Well, then your trials are partly your responsibility in that those trials are the answer to your prayer. That's how it happens, is you have to encounter the dark night of desperation and disappointment, but it doesn't remain there if you will allow that to drive you to the presence of the living Christ in whom there is light, love, grace, and in, and in his presence, there is nothing that can overtake you or overcome you because there is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot overcome. So I ask you, as I did in the beginning, have you ever thought about how you grow in faith? I want to grow in faith because I go to church more often and because I read the right books, listen to the right podcasts, and maybe get the right anointed prayer person to pray for me. These are all the ways I thought I grew in faith, and that's how I want to grow in faith. Those have their place. I'm not belittling those or dismissing them. But it's not the primary way we grow. The primary is trials. Let me introduce you to a little illustration that has haunted me since the moment I first found it, and I want it to haunt you as well. Would you want to put that image up, Cindy? So this is how it works. We all start with a particular amount of faith that we say, God, grow and mature my faith. So what he does is he allows, I'm not saying he causes, I don't know how all of that works, but what I am saying in his sovereign goodness, he allows circumstances that are beyond your faith ability. Let me expose another lie. You ever heard someone say, God won't give you anything that you can't handle? <laughs> Lies. The truth is, if you want to grow, God will consistently bring you into circumstances that you cannot handle. Because this is the impetus to be drawn near to Jesus so that you can be further equipped and so that you can grow. And so what happens is that trial creates a tension, a crisis, a desperation that eventually, however your journey leads you there, you come back to the feet of Jesus and you say, help, Lord, like that man falling down the stairs. I need you. I can't. You can. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He causes the crisis of desperation to become an explosion of faith. And all of a sudden, that little box of faith expands. Thank you. And now your faith has gone from the brown box to the black box. 
So now you're cruising along. You've overcome. Maybe you do some, maybe you get invited to speak about your trial. And you get to bear witness and share your testimony. And people just love to hear that part of the story, right? No one wanted you to speak whenever your box of faith was in the brown. But now that it's exploded to the black after we know your circumstances, you'll get invitations. We want to hear your story. So what happens next? You cruise. No, now you're ready for the blue trials. And so God allows a whole new set of circumstances that brings you the mature journey from your mature journey of faith and victory in Jesus back to your knees in desperation, saying, I can't, but you can. There is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot overcome, and now I need you which will then empower us to bear witness to our faith. If you were in your 20s and 30s, let me encourage you with this. I promise you that one day you will bless in your maturity what you curse in your youth. Every one of those sadness and disappointments and really spirit-crushing realities that you crush, that you curse in your youth, I promise you, If you keep walking with Jesus, there will be a day where you bless in your in your in your maturity what you cursed in your youth. Hang in there. Hang out with old people like me and let us encourage you with stories of the faithfulness of God to help impact. This is why we pray God make us an intergenerational community of faith so that we can learn from one another. When I was in Uganda, I met briefly a woman who I will carry in my heart until the day that I die. When I listened to her story, and I won't go into all the details, you've already heard about her a few times, but in particular, and I want to be sensitive. When she was in high school, she was a victim of an assault. And she was defenseless because she can't walk. So it's like this double cruelty of oppressing someone who can't defend themselves. I could barely even process hearing that part of the story. And then I found out from that experience she also got pregnant. I didn't know even how you would carry a baby full term, frankly, and, and, and not be able to stretch your legs out and walk. She kept that baby. And when the baby was born, she named her Blessing. And we all got to meet eight-year-old Blessing while we were over there. And I'll tell you, even in this moment recounting the story, I can barely wrap my hand my head around that level of grace at work in the heart of someone. God can turn our heartaches into avenues of blessing. We're going to get ready to close and we're going to sing a song that we've sang many times. But as we think about this reality, as we think about the way in which God uses our disappointments and trials to cause us to grow, I want you to be mindful when you sing this verse. I've carried a burden far too long on my on my own. And most of the time we carry those burdens far too long because we're trying to scheme on how we can fix it and control it until we get the gift of holy exhaustion. And then you'll sing these words, I wasn't created to bear it alone. And if you're lucky, you can sing these words with truth. But I hear your invitation to let it all go. Yes, I see it now. I'm laying it down. And I know that I need you. Every success in your faith will immediately carry with it the temptation to lessen your conscious need of Jesus. In fact, there are some people hanging on to Jesus to get free of habits. And the hope is 
Once they mature in their faith, they'll be free and they can cruise. It's a funny thing about Christian discipleship. Would-be disciples want to be want to grow into the place where they no longer need the grace of Jesus. Guess what, my friends? That place never happens. What life is is a recurring invitation to deepen your revelation that I need you. And that, my friends, is the safest and most powerful place that you can be. As we get ready to close... Create some space to talk to God about your disappointments. Ask him to open your eyes to the way he's used the disappointments in your path, in your past, in ways you didn't see until now, so that you can enter into joy and bear witness to God's faithfulness.